we've been in discussions this morning or early afternoon of migrating to a uh, permanent computer where we don't have to reset these things every time. So yes. Mark's in uh, wife negotiations. <laughs> hey, Alex, how you doing? Moonbase is tuning in. That's great. Um, Moonbase, as everyone knows, is a great shop down in downtown St. Louis. So always good to have, have some local people tuning in as well. Um, <laughs> so for this, yeah, for this, the, all the previous VRDs, to give you some back behind the scenes content, uh, what happens is the week before I realized, oh shoot, I don't actually have a streaming computer. All I have are a bunch of Macs, Macs sitting at home, which can't really stream particularly well. So I start randomly messaging people trying to find a random computer to stream with, uh, get it usually the night before and try to set up everything. So that's why our technical stuff has been as perfect as can possibly yes. be. Absolutely. Um, so trying to figure out if we actually are going to go all in. Um, but yeah, that's probably more detail than anyone here cares about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so VRD4. VRD4. It's so finished. We, we are a little later in the uh, recap than we want to be, obviously. But uh, I had a heck of a busy end of semester between uh, my own four classes teaching and then some master's classes. I'm getting another master's degree because I'm a glutton for punishment. Mm -hmm. And then we had the holidays, uh, so we are here to recap. We have Elaine as the winner again, um, but bringing in some saucy tech this time. Um, yeah, the story of this VRD is 100% Elaine managing to float her one-card win combo all the way down to pick 15, and she probably could have had it go far later than that. Yeah, no, no. We had briefly discussed it, I think, on stream, but I, I, I think only a hair... And I'm not even sure if that was on streams and, uh, or just outside. And then um, Elaine had discussed it with friends on a Discord somewhere. And this became the saucy auto kill, right? It was on Autumn's Discord. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Arcane Savant. For, so reading it, it's on screen right now. Uh, I think we did talk about it in the last one. Right. But this card, our, our thinking was, oh, you could go have Biorhythm, and you put them to zero life, and you at one life. Um, Elaine and Autumn's Discord took that, innovated it, and I think either independently uh, came up with the other kill, uh, which was Kindred Charge. Right. So you use Arcane Savant and go find a card that you drafted that isn't in your deck, and you leave Kindred Charges sitting in your sideboard every time, cast it, make infinite copies, and you kill them with Splinter Twin combo, the equivalent of. Yeah, um, you, you could also do the same thing with Heat Shimmer, effectively. Yeah, Heat Shimmer, uh, Elaine, there, there are other versions of this effect. Elaine decided not to go with Heat Shimmer or some of the other ones, because they target. So that in the case sense. where they kill your Arcane Savant in response, right. um, you still do manage to copy something, something. slightly better. Right. Um, probably doesn't really matter. It didn't matter in any of the matches we saw on comment right. on commentary, but and then uh, it, it does make it so that you can't just steal the card that they were going to use it for their combo. Right. right. So if they take Arcane Savant, this is effectively a time vault like kill where you can't hate pick against it. Now I did find it interesting that Elaine grabbed the Aether Searcher, Aether Searcher right before Savant yeah. instead of going for. So this was Elaine's added tech, right? Where. Elaine can tutor up the Savant, technically. I guess she had to because it's the next card, right? Correct, so that's okay. why. This that, won't so happen a, again. Right, the, yeah. This, this was purely, Elaine managed to find the perfect silver bullet when no one knows Arcane Savant exists. Right. She she managed to get Arcane Savant, find the kill in, instant kill for it with Kindred Charge. Then, because after she saw that, she said, well, no one knows about Aether Searcher either, so I'll grab the seven mana card that will go tutor my one card combo. Right. And then she managed to become incredibly greedy, floating our Tinker to pick 16. So she had three one card combos in right. her deck. Uh, it was obviously ludicrous. It ended up just destroying almost everybody. I think she actually only went 5 2 because yeah. of some bad luck. Um, well, I mean, she was heavy on the artifact deck, and yeah. as we know, what happens with that is uh, the green decks will, we, if they've got the right hate, I mean, that's what I did two VRDs ago, right? Like, my my deck didn't work out well, except for against the Artifact decks, which right. I just crushed. Uh, and she lost to Kyle's Artifact, uh, Kyle's green deck, and evidently he had really good hands and comboed off really really well as well. Um, you know, the deck didn't perform outside of those matches, but, like, Collector Oof, things like that, right? Yep. 
Um, Kyle's deck, I think, was actually pretty solid. I liked it. And then I don't remember what her other loss so was. So the other loss was actually on camera against Mike Viviano. It was oh, a right. really intense match. That's a really good one to go back and rewatch if you get a chance. Yeah, Viviano's deck was really interesting. Uh, well, and we'll talk about that later. I mean, it was it's, it, not overly interesting, but like just watching it play out. I, it's been done before, so it's not, Correct. I'm not saying it's not good. It was good, but it's not necessarily like unique or cutting edge. Um, but it was definitely. Um, you know, we had not seen it in our VRDs as much. Correct. It, it's it's one that I think it very much fits a pattern that we have seen before, but it, it still was doing right. interesting things. Well, the first two matches, it just crushed. Like, I, the first two matches I saw it play, because uh, I was on, I was out there doing support, and I it just was like turn four Ulamogging people, and, you know, like turn four crater hoofing, and it was just dream crushing people and i was like oh man this may thing they just made roll the tournament and then it hit like uh a couple losses in a row yes and... i totally agree with common that she was the clear vrd player of the year 2019 oh yeah uh it was pretty amazing brandon though also i mean he's had really solid performances he's taken second the last two i believe yeah he's not been uh, able oh, no, to sorry. close it he, he took third the previous one right so he took third and now second and he was just talking in our group chat about how he's definitely going to make it a three one two and come in for the come in for the first place in the last one. Yeah. So he's he's very excited for the next one. In second place he gets the auto invite back. So he's gonna be he and Elaine are certainly in for the next for the one that's happening coming up. We're gonna talk about that after we finish this recap. Yeah, Brandon I I, I really we talked about we had a uh, a steering committee meeting recently and over drinks and dinner and we were talking about how Brandon's kind of the, the quintessential poster boy of a uh, poster person for V R D in a sense, in that like the things he does. He is gorgeous. Well, yes. one he's beautiful, oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I mean, one, he's a beautiful, beautiful man. Um, but outside of that, but the, the things he does, like the vision he has yeah. for like some complex interactions and draft. I mean, he doesn't just have a, a singular format that he's doing. It's not like I'm just going to do, I mean, Elaine drafts amazing decks, but a lot of Elaine's decks are very similar in a sense. Um, yeah, the the mocks the the quad mox start. Yeah, I mean, amazing. just like, like and and he's so adaptable, right? Yes. Like, I that's I think his greatest strength is that he doesn't really have a master plan. I think he's just that quick on his feet to see what's going on and is able to respond, um, and just like has all of these different ideas going in his head that can just really pan out. I mean, like that, that he, he main decked. Uh, it's not on this screen because it's on the we have. Uh, the on one. the bottom 20 but like he main decked that alila Ar- artful provocateur right yes, yes he and did. it i saw him win at games right like that's a card i talked about as a fringe possibility and he saw uh let's get her yeah. up yeah and he saw it there and ran with it right yeah i think alila was ended up being not terrible for him he does uh he does have he does have certain proclivities though for, absolutely for uh, for cards that probably shouldn't be in his deck, like Altar of the Brood. Dude, you do not diss on Altar of the Brood. <laughs> he loves that card. It is a 40-card format, and you're making oh, tokens, man. right? He and I have been talking about uh, some of his choices, about what he's going to do for There's the next There's so time. many of my EDH decks that run Altar of the Brood. <laughs> it's it's a, often a win con. Um, yeah, the, the, the four mox start, I think, is really cool. He could have even had the chrome mox if he'd wanted to have it. He chose not to go for the fifth mox there, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think his deck ended up being very good. Um, his decks are just scary to play against because you just yeah. don't know what's going to happen, right? I mean, it's just there's no one path. There's right. balance into into milling you out. Yeah, like it, it, against Cody, like Cody was win- Cody Owen was squarely winning a game against him, and then countered something, and then later was just like, I forgot about balance. I forgot he had balance, and. Uh, yeah. So alter the brood as an average of 35, 35th round pick. That's about right. <laughs> I think it's about eleven <laughs> rounds too early. Yeah. Uh, like yeah, Cody just forgot about balance. He countered threat, and then something happened, and then he just dropped balance. And I had to read. Yes. I had actually not seen balance in a while. I forgot balance doesn't affect artifacts. Yeah. And it was ridiculous. That's been broken since Alpha. Yeah. No, so Brandon's deck, I mean, like always, I think he really wanted to do the fast bond start, but Kyle, let's jump over to Kyle and talk about that, about how he sniped fast bond in round one. So that Ky- is unconventional. So Kyle was, so fast bond's actually gone round one the last two drafts. Did it really? Because Brandon took it round one. Yeah, you're right, you're right. The time before. So Kyle was on support. Average of round nine, though. Right. Yeah, it shouldn't be round one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's wrong. 
but Kyle was on support for the last one, for, for number three, mm-hmm. and he really liked Brandon's deck, I think, sure. and that's what, you know, he saw, and at least what he liked was the Fastbond, Zurin Orb, yeah. Crucible uh, combo. That's kind of, what, that's one of those And that's why he that... drafted Emery where he did. Now, I think Emery's in the right spot. He really only drafted Emery, and this was from his own mouth. He drafted Emery to get back Crucible. Oh, right? interesting. I think that's a mistake. Yeah, fast right? on strip on Crucible is very good, but yeah, to, to take those cards right there, right. even the channel, and take them when realistically no one else is going to take channel. There's going to be one other green draft at the table, right. and they probably aren't going to need channel in round two. Not with what they're doing, right? No. And so, I mean, so like, he, to take that in lieu of power. He beat a lane with channel Emrakul. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I, I really like... Yeah, no, power. I don't like his first picks here. I mean, I think they're fine in the deck. I think the deck's good. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he has enough blue for the force of will there. No. I don't... It's kind of odd. Um, so, I mean, I think he's got some really good stuff going on. I think he just ends up a little all over the place. I think he's actually kind of a good example of somebody who is brand new to the format, who sees all this power, sees all the directions you can go. And then if you kind of dig through, you see, like, he's making lots of good cards. Right. But it's almost... Even if we jump to the second half of the draft there, he ends up taking a lot of cards that don't make the main deck and mm-hmm. aren't really sideboard cards. Right, right. Yeah, and Brandon. that's something we've been discussing a lot lately is that um, that focus on that early those new ones where you end up and I know in my first one and I if my deck was good I you know I got second place but I ended up with so many cards that I was thinking of them as main deck cards yes and they just weren't right mm-hmm. like they, they I, I couldn't run them all I was forgetting I was drafting not like this was going to end up being twenty five to twenty six cards main deck exactly um. And, you know, and that's about where, you know, with this format, you can definitely play looser with the lands depending on the deck. Like the second one I did when I had the green deck, I think I had 14 lands yep. because I had moxes and I had, you know, all sorts of stuff. And you were nearly mono green there too, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I was, like I, was, artifacts. I was green, white, black. Okay. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. But yeah. I had plenty of lands. I, th- th- that's one of the other sides is when you only have one color or yeah. have one color plus a splash. You can go but I had there. Noble Hierarch. I had multiple Mana Dorks. I had two Moxes. Sure. I, I just had a ridiculous source of amount of you know fixing. And... So yeah, the other the other big green drafter at the table was CJ. So CJ walked in with the first seat and he had a plan. He was going to go Storm. Um, I think he got scared out Actually, of Storm. That, that should be Viviano, not CJ. Uh, no, Viviano's at the end seven. I CJ was in first mono green too. Uh, no, Viviano was that was the lands deck. So he, oh, he that's right. Okay, six. He yeah, went with sorry. the Thespian stage, which we'll get to right. in a minute. It was CJ that I thought was going to run everything. Early. Yes. Not not Viviano. When I said earlier, Viviano's first two. Okay. CJ, I watched just first his first two matches. He won. Yeah. And just Rafelos, he just never underestimate the ridiculousness that is Rafelos. Right. Rafelos is insane. Um, and he ended up going four and three, which is really respectable yeah. for a first time appearance. But he went two zero out of the gate and just was. Yeah. possum stomping people I mean it was just it was ridiculous what he was doing and I was like there's our winner I think possum stomping is a very Missouri phrase I've never heard that from <laughs> it's anybody a, else Southern Illinois but yeah same thing right? <laughs> but, but basically the same place right? yeah like yeah I mean it was wild and then he hit a couple rough matches mm-hmm. and, and dropped uh, but yeah I mean like when his so his deck was the one I was saying is we've seen before right there's nothing yes. ultimately unique here it's big green um, he, he chose good targets for it. He did. He chose a lot of targets for it. So, like, if we jump over here, he has, in this top half, the things that you're going to be searching for, Battlesphere. Uh, I don't think Battlesphere made his cut. Battlesphere, Craterhoof Behemoth are the two that he had in the first half. And the second half, he had a ton of other things, right? right. He ended up grabbing... He had Ulamog in the first half, of course. Yep, Ulamog, um, Woodfall Primus, uh, Progenitus. Just, yeah. like, you don't need that many targets for your tooth and nail. Um, voracious Hydra. He had some like mid mid range things as well. Yeah, I, I feel like, like he had a couple. Hydra. I, I, he had a couple picks that I would have. You could have swapped out. I think he, did someone grab or else grab um, uh, Bane the Bane or, of Progress. Bane of Progress. Ooh, I don't know. Did Bane of Progress get drafted? No, no. Okay. That's one of See, those that's a, that's, EDH players. Right, that's a mistake there. Like Bane of Progress would have been really good for him. Yes, especially against Elaine. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, so that's just very fair. Right. Um, but no, I think overall CJ's deck was very solid. Um, Drag a tree speaker was doing work for him, man. I, I, I had kind of, I underestimated that, but every time I watched it, he was able to just pump it so quick. Yeah. Um, uh, Bane of Progress cost six, but you can tutor into it. Um, also, he had a million mana dorks that he could have cast it on turn three or four pretty easily. Yeah, I saw him cast turn three Ulamog multiple times. Yeah. 
you know. Um, I, I would have actually liked to see his deck go more into the unfair elf category, right? Like, go for the Elvish Archdruid and right. some of those cards, because I think that he could have gone deeper on the one-mana dorks instead of playing things like Eureka. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm very curious right. to actually hear how Eureka worked out for him. I haven't seen him cast it, so... Yeah, and I don't know if he ended up splashing the blue and doing the time twister or not. I mean, he had that early blue stuff and then just kind of completely punted out of it. So I don't know if yeah, he ended I, up using it or not. Yeah, I, I don't know either. Um, I, I don't... If he, if it was, it was really light. It was just for, like, the mystical right. and for the time twister. Right. Which doesn't seem worth it to me, but I don't know. Right, and he had the noble there, so... Um, so other... They actually were a bunch of green drafters at the table. The other big one was Cody Owen. Yeah, so Cody's deck, and Cody's deck was, uh, I I will say it was good, but I will also fully admit that I I helped theorycraft this deck. (laughs) Um, So I know Elaine feared Cody's deck, and and a lot of people really feared Cody's deck in a lot of ways. And I I think he he had a couple bad beats where he just made some misplays. Um, I think he lost himself a little bit in a few matches. Um, Cody's deck, actually, the more I think about it, is one of the big things that we, that went wrong here was, um, uh, oh yeah, Time Walk's really good in this deck. Yes, it is. Attack. <laughs> like, where a lot of times I think in VRD, Time Walk ends up being just a bad explorer. Yeah. Um, his deck with attacking creatures, right, it, it Time Walk ends up being really good. Who um, was the handsomest drafter? That's an excellent question from B. Curry. Uh, I don't know who that person is. I don't know who it is, but, it uh, could be you know. anyone. Uh, yeah, I th- the handsomest drafter award. I think that needs to be one of the new, the new, <laughs> the new, new votes for right, the community. Right. That can't possibly end badly. Right. Um, but yeah, so Cody's deck I think ends up being pretty good here. I think what happens with Cody, and I know there were some people making fun of it on stream, uh, that he didn't end up grabbing True Name Nemesis, right? And I, I wasn't making fun. I do think it's yeah. the biggest miss of the draft. Right. Though. And well, I, I sort of think about, it, and this is something that I know I've guilty of from a previous one we talked a little bit before is i think what this is a case of because again in theory drafting like it, even for me it never came up in our thoughts when we were talking yeah. about through this deck i think that if you have an idea like a particularly where you're going out which is like i'm going blue white control right where you're going to go like i'm doing this focusing i'm doing flash we had it focused that every creature was going to have flash that every spell almost every spell almost every spell he had would be an instant he would almost right. have nothing and he would play that game mm-hmm. That's how we end up with Sharkto Crab, rather yeah. than like a true name Nemesis earlier, right? So we got so hyped on this is the, yeah, th- this is the way. Now Shampoo Shark was fine, like it, it really actually won him a couple games. It gets bigger. Um, um so th- this is a great question though. Why isn't that deck playing Aether Vial? You know, I've thought about that since then actually. I think, uh, it seems like I think it's a great question. question. I just don't. It, is a single vial in this? This was a question I just had. I, I said, "Is a single vial worth it?" Right. So, like, in in a deck, in a sixty card deck, you're you have four. You're more likely to end up with your vial right yep. early on. But like in a forty card format, is the chance that I'm going to draw it later when I don't need it? Is it worth it? So, is is vial vial viable? Well, I mean, if viable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, let's assume that vials restricted in modern. Would you right. still play it? Probably. Like you probably still play it as a one of. I don't know. Would you? I would. You I would? don't know. I, I don't. I don't play creature decks. So right. I'm, like, I'm a bad example of this, but. Yeah, I don't know if I would play Vile as a one of. Yeah, fair enough. I, very possibly not. I mean, the fact that it handles the counter spells makes it that makes it pretty clear for me that I would. But yeah, I wasn't even thinking about it necessarily in relation to this deck. I was thinking about it in relation to like a Death and Taxes White Weenie deck. Yeah. Uh, this card's really good, though. I was a very impressed with Wildborn. Yeah, that card's, that card's bonkers. Yeah. I mean, because it, allow, again, allows you just that mana sink to just make your other things really ridiculous. And since most of your creatures are flash, you get to do it at the end of turn. Right. After you didn't counter anyway, you flash in some, you flash in that guy, you flash in something else, you make it, you make it grow plus three. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think his deck was, ended up being very good. Uh, the Ice Fang Coatl, and th- that's actually brought up one of the... We can talk about this new change that we're going to be trying for this next time. Um, so in addition to having deck lists on screen and having players lock in their deck choices, the other major rules change that's going into effect for this next time uh, is cards that are self-referential uh, are going to be able to grab additional copies of themselves. So... so sure. The, the one example, we're taking this easy to begin with, right? There's a lot of places this could go. Right. Um, but for the first version of this, we're just going to test to run it out. If you draft a Squadron Hawk, you get four copies of Squadron Hawk. That's that's the rules change we're going for for this next right. one. So for self-referential cards, you get to find, you can find, you can have four copies in your deck. Right. Um, that's, 
it's just the the goal the goal being we want to have more of these cards drafted and right now it's not reasonable to draft them yeah the mere rule, servitor there you go mere servitor could make the cut yeah um let's see let's make sure that i'm actually before we say that yeah okay so it references yeah. itself so that one that one's fine um of note uh yeah self-tutoring how, however right. i think i think everyone understands the spirit of it but yeah i don't know the exact wording so if you have better phrasing self-tutoring might be better right um but yeah the the, the place this is not referencing, though, which would have helped the Ice Fang Coatl, would be Snowlands. something like Snowlands. Right. Snowlands are still, you have to draft one Snowland for each of the, uh, for each of them. Um, Rune Snag is, is one that, ooh. Yeah, we don't, yeah, we want to be careful. We that. haven't talked about that, actually, so that's that's an interesting one to think about, but we'll have to get around to that for next time. Right. Um, my gut reaction is that one probably shouldn't be, so I think right. self-tutoring might be, a, might be a good, <laughs> might be a good right. rule for this yeah, one. Yeah, well, Thank you, uh, very smart people, for <laughs> which actually so, mere servitor doesn't tutor doesn't tutor. So right. no, so it, that one wouldn't be. So we're gonna stick with just uh, self tutoring yeah. for now. Please God, no AK. All right, so no, no, we're just gonna be self tutoring. Self tutoring is really the, the spirit of this. We're, right. we're trying to make a minor change, see if how it works, and then potentially roll it forward. Relentless rats is not one. Uh, Relentless rats is not self tutoring. So. Um, anyway, that's that's the major rules right. change we're going for for the next one to see how if that affects anything. And, and we have not, some other couple possible ones, but we're not doing uh we're not pulling out wizards and doing multiple changes at one time for bad yeah, points. So <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, but yeah, so we'll try it out. Persistent no. petitioners is not. <laughs> it's not self tutoring. <laughs> you you can have as many of them as you want. Just, just draft take as one, many. Just... One for each pick. You can have twenty three of them. Just have twenty three picks ready for it. Yeah. Um. Cool. So that's that's the other major change that's going through. All right. So let's run through here a little more. So, so we talked John, about directors. John Morris. We haven't talked about yet. He ended up with a really sad finish, which I think is well below the quality of his deck. Yeah. Uh, I, so John issue. I think I see the the issue for me with John's deck was that he had that, and we've seen it before. Um, and I think it ended up in the same thing. It starts off with a storm deck. It looks like, and it looks like it's going to start with start strong. And he had wanted. Just from hearing him talk, it sounded like he had a Drake transitional. He could go Storm or he could go to Reanimator. Yep. But I don't think he ended up with Strong of either then, right? Correct. Um, and he, he actually and no said one was going regretting. against no one was going against the Storm stuff. He could have finished the Storm stuff easily and just had a perfect Storm deck. Yep. No one was going against the Reanimator stuff. He could have had a full Reanimator deck. He, he regretted at the point on pick 21 where he got Gristlebrand and Tomb. Mm -hmm. um, he said at that point he wished that he had gone all in on the Reanimator plan. Um, that he had just abandoned the storm stuff and not mm -hmm. tried to go both and just gone become a reanimator deck at that point. That was that was what uh, during the right. interview he said. I think this is our highest appearance of Ashiot Dream Render, which is it keeps moving up the draft. This is the third time it's been drafted in ours. Yep. And I think I grabbed it in like thirty five, and the last time it was like twenty two in you, for you, and then here yep. it's moved up to here. So this card just keeps moving up the ranks. It's really good. Yeah, it's it's just. But no, I think that his deck was is is like a sixty percent version of two decks, and it could have been right. an eighty percent version yeah. of one of them. And it's got you know, I mean, it's just it's full chock full of good cards, right? Yeah, and, and he did say that he he thinks his deck was probably a three four deck that he piloted to an 07. He just like didn't he didn't know all the interactions. Mm -hmm. There was just like these those are two very difficult strategies to pilot, even if you do know them very well. Right. So I think that he ended up like in a seven round tournament, you're going to end in a bad spot. So yeah, I I actually think that that deck. I think he drafted really well, and then for the actual playing and building, right. it, it kind of he got lost in his own head on it for a bit. That so makes sense. It's a shame to see because he's a much better player than that yeah. shows. So, um, then Elaine, we've already talked a lot, a little bit about, but um, other other than her one card combo that she had, she also just had a pretty solid blue artifact deck. Yeah. So this ended up being a little different than Elaine's normal fair. I mean, she has her normal, you know, she she got force of negation but lost force of will. Um, you know, so she lost some of the counter spells she would normally have. <laughs> Uh, but she just transitioned into artifacts and kind of a the Blyden from you know from previous times type combo. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, one of Elaine's greatest strengths is she is often not drafting with just the with, with uh, like we talked about where you're not where you're thinking about sideboard cards. Elaine is very often thinking about sideboard cards. Uh, yes. You know how how to approach that. And some of that comes from having played in four of these events now. Right, right, right. She, right. Has, she has four times more experience, or infinite more experience than all the entry right. players, and most of these players haven't played in more than one or two. So she just has seen, like, she has had Gloom cast against her and right. realized how painful that is. Right, you know, she's got her Acid Rain, which I think she's taken every single time. Yep. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I think it's just a pretty standard artifact deck. There wasn't a lot of comp. There was another artifact deck, but it, they don't think they were competing for the same type of pieces other than the early stuff. It's kind of just disgusting, right? She was able, she managed to pull off uh, both the Arcane Savant, right? Right. But also she got Time Vault, right? And she had that combo in her deck. She had uh, she had Narset just as a lock piece. She got Karn, and then she got the Karn lock that as well. Right. So she had three of the best combos right. in the format in her deck. Yeah. So like I mean, I think and any then it's one very of those, time ravel to protect it. Right? I, I, any one of those would have been one of the best combos at the table, and she had three of them. Right. And again, uh, I know she took this two in VRD two. Uh, Dovin hand of control, I think, is just a bonkers in this format. I think I've I, been convinced. I think it's better than I think it's better than OK, which is where I had right. it initially. But I don't think it's I don't think it's in the same ballpark as the top tier walkers. No, no, but I think it's solidly in that middle tier walkers. It just does so much. Yes. Um, and it's just really really good. Um, so Brandon, we already talked about your deck. Sorry, uh, it was great. Um, Mike Viviano, though his deck, his deck was really cool and got was shut down. To watch. <laughs> it was it was sad to watch draft. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there was one mainly one reason why. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, let's review for Brandon a minute since right, he's in right. chat here. Uh, four Moxes is amazing. Uh, four Moxes with paradoxical outcome is amazing. I am all about uh, what was the pick I was all about earlier? Oh, I was all about the Alela pick. Yep. Uh, I'm bitter ordeal. He finally managed to get, which yeah, is great. I wasn't here to steal his ordeal. <laughs> the library pick. I don't know. I'm still never convinced. I don't know if he has enough regular card draw to keep. Agreed. Like library fits more in like the draw go style, so I don't like the library pick. That's when you're my... smashing some moxen into a mind twist and then trying to get your library to go, it seems a little rough. Paradox would have been insane. Um, so the the Thopter sword combo was interesting in that deck. I yeah. don't think you really need it, but you guess you need some way to finish out the game. He and needs that's finishers. Fine. It's good. It was the right call. Yeah. Um, Obviously, everyone knows that the I mean, uh, the altar was a terrible pick, but Mentor made up for it. Him having the grindstone combo would have been much more ideal. Yes. Than, but obviously, Viviano grabbed that pretty quick. You yeah. Know? Uh, Liliana, the last hope, I think, is a walker that is undervalued, despite being pretty highly valued. Yeah, I think the, I think the issue is like her second ability just doesn't feel that great in the format very often. True. Uh, you know, like the removal's solid, but I don't. I just heard her second just kind of. I did see the Ophiomancer Skull Clamp go off once, and that's just like a commander player's dream. Right. Of uh, let's pull up Ophiomancer since that's one that doesn't doesn't necessarily see play in every format. Yeah. Um, basically, every turn you get a snake, and then at the beginning of their upkeep, after you've sacrificed it to your Skull Clamp, you get another copy, so you have one for attack and defense, and you can sack it off for two cards every turn. Right. It's just ridiculous. Uh, and then the balance obviously was the you know the big. The big, the big daddy there. The big. I, I do think library can be bad and is bad in an average deck, but in a good deck for library, it's the most, it's the best card in the deck. Hey, there's Elaine. Elaine, we love your deck, and it's insane that you were able to pull it off. I look forward to watching you get crushed next time. That'll be great. Yeah. Um. All right. So jump to Cody here. So or oh, we're still still on Mike. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Mike. Mike went for the lands deck. This is one we've seen before as well. Um. He. Ended up playing the Glacial Chasm. Probably doesn't need it. Right. Um, despite... Renin 6 did a whole lot of work. Renin 6, I think, actually deserved its two-pick spot. Yeah. I, at the time, was really skeptical, but I think it played out really well. I think Renin 6 here, uh, I mean, there are a lot of good one butts, you know? And it's it kind of like it was in Legacy, where, where it, you know, the problem was it hurt a lot of the main creatures. Yeah. Um, I saw Eidolon do a lot of good work for him. Uh, Painter yeah. Grindstone, he managed Obviously, to. Obviously, right. You can even use that one fairly. He just used Grindstone <laughs> yeah. to. He just turned three. People. He just naturally like had it in his opening hand. At least two games I saw where he was just like, uh, you know, yep. That's <laughs> the Painter one, Grindstone win. You that's know? the one where he knocked Elaine down and had, had her start off. Yeah. What was she? I think one and two at the beginning. Yeah. Um, the Veil of Summer pick. Uh, I. Oh yeah. Now that card, I mean, I I wondered if that if that high was right. So you got to remember, like. Last VRD uh, three, I think I grabbed that like fortieth. Yeah. Right. So, and I knew it was higher. I knew it was much higher. Um, I didn't know if I felt it was that much higher, but I don't also think it's wrong. So, I, you know. So of note, every one of his opponents is playing either black or. Gray. Exactly. Right. Right. I, I said, <laughs> when when he first did it, I'm like, that's too high. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, no, that's probably not too high. That card is just wildly it's broken. it's not only not a sideboard card it's also one of the best cards in your main deck against every opponent yeah <laughs> i think it's a, i think it's absolutely right to be in the top 10 
Um, once upon a time, he also got he he kind of played around with a lot of these new cards that came out. Um, Man after my own heart. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Eidolon, um, Eidolon of the Great Revel, like uh, some of that stuff, I thought was a little too cute. Trying to go into the into the uh, into the answers there, I right. guess that was just an uh, answer for. I don't John. think he ended up playing both uh, the the uh, bear uh, both assaults, bear assault and la- seismic. I think he ended up switching between them. I saw him win with seismic, but I know he switched into bear at least once. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, I, I think bear is probably better, right? I think this card in a this format. Card. I think so. Yeah, I mean, because like you know, with the bear, so I make a bear. I don't get to do the immediate damage, but then I two, hit for two. But then the next time I'm hitting for another two. And people aren't really playing wraths. Uh, no, it's just, no, no. I don't know. I think creature beatdown is this format is slow enough that usually it's okay. Right. Um. Yeah, I think the, I think his deck ended up being really solid. The punishing fire thing, I don't, I, I never saw it happen, but I saw it once. I think. Yeah. Uh, I I think it was early. I think early on, it sometimes it felt like his deck just had like a lot of complicated lines. His games all, and I don't know, I don't know Mike well enough to know if he's a slower player as well, but like his de- games took forever. Like the one between him and Cody Owen was just like. Cody won it, and but I and it was like watching paint dry. It was just the longest most. Oh, I love those grindy <laughs> matches. I like lands though in general. Right. So um, I know he was sad to be to lose out on his dark depths to Cody <laughs> in the, so, the most greedy hate pick of all time. So Cody Gunnett gets a uh, table talk, browbeat <laughs> slash bullied. I don't know what word we're gonna use for this, but uh, yeah, uh, we're gonna pull up a browbeat, and that looks about right. Yeah, uh, th- this is basically what happened to Cody. This is what happened, <laughs> and why Cody Gunnett picks pick. Three dark, pick three dark depths that he's not even going to use, right? Yes. So pick Mike, one Mox Ruby, pick two Mana Crypt, pick three card that I'm not going to put in any form in any right. deck. <laughs> I mean, he had many. He might play it just there. I don't know. I mean, but so bad. yeah, Mike picks the stage and the table basically just talks Cody into <laughs> drafting dark depths, and he does. It was and, his first time in there, and Mike gets really sad. And then Cody goes on to have a pretty solid deck. <laughs> yeah, his deck ended up being okay. How, how, what was his record in the end? He ended up being 4-3 as well. Yeah, he was stu- stuck in that middle um, 4-3 section. Um, but yeah, no, his, he ended up being great. Yeah. Um, the I, I, I thought that he was going to go into a more aggro beatdown, kind of like a Ravager Shops type right, build. Right, right. But he ended up just kind of going for, I'm going to cast giant monsters, like yeah. tr- like Thraxos, or Traxos, and uh, and try to... Forge Master did, did quite a bit of work for him. But not um, in an unfair way. I usually see Forge Master right. in a, I'm going to find Time Vault and win. And that wasn't what it was this time at all. No, no, no. Actually, a lot of times I saw it, like, he just had it out as beats and then used it as an insurance policy. Like, oh, they went to remove something and he just, yep. you know... Got something else, right? I could see, I could see Koldatha Forge Master really seeing play with Arcane Savant because Arcane Savant, I believe, is an artifact. Unless it's, it might just have. A it is form. not Cody. Cody Owen lost oh. because it is not an artifact because she uh, Elaine went searcher yep. and then uh, for the Savant and or played the Savant and Cody was thinking it was an artifact and had some spell I forget what it was. It was basically a, a, an artifact removal and it didn't. Wow. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what it was, but tried to stop it, but it wasn't an artifact, and he, he lost. It, lo- it has that weird border. So I just yeah, yeah, was... yeah, the conspiracy border is kind of artifacty. Exactly. Um, but he ended up playing a workshop, and I think it was actually a good workshop. Yeah, it's they... the first we've had where I think the workshop felt good, right? It was um, way too early, but that's one of those, if you don't know... Right, right, you don't know what it's been, that it's... Because a lot of times, it, the problem with workshop, uh, I know Eric experienced this in VRD2... Uh, or no, I no, I had it in VRD too. Eric Eric was uh, Tolarian Academy that had the issue. Yes. Um, it's like I didn't have it. Actually, it it did fine for me in VRD too, but it d- didn't do amazing. Um, it did allow me to cast you know combo pieces pretty easily. The um, problem is in, in vintage and formats like that, you have the ability to generate your turn all that extra mana into card advantage right. and into lots of other effects. Right. That use it all very quickly, and the games end fast enough that you don't lose the effect of having this extra land sitting there not doing anything. Right. Uh, in this format, the games will go on for long enough time periods where that land just sits going fallow yeah. and not generating any value. Yeah, it worked for me in two because I had enough two-card Montes that were artifact-based Yes. Yep. that it, it ended up working out. But there were some times where I had it where I was just like, I, I can't cast Narset and, you know, I'm going to... <laughs> Yeah, but the rest of his deck was pretty solid as well. I mean, Tezzer yeah. Agent of Bolas, he just had like a good... Yeah, it's a good artifact, artifact, artifact good mid-range, you know. 
Also, I appreciate him going deep on the lands and getting dark water catacombs. That's one of those that I feel like people overvalue the known lands. Right. Um, we've talked about this before, but right. I think people overvalue the fetch lands and dual lands and undervalue the cards like this. Well, and so this is I talked about that day a little bit, and I've talked about with uh, Cody Owen since then. So at this point, fetches mm-hmm. better than duels, right? So I think that's probably, probably pretty clear. I agree. But I think that particularly one of the reasons is there's obviously more copies of duels, but the ones that I think oddly, and a lot of times with lands, I think a lot of times it's one person pulls the trigger and then people follow, right? So in VRD 2 and 3, I pulled the trigger on the filter lands early on, and then that caused more filters to get drafted. Right. Notice here, no one until I think finally in like in the 30s somewhere, someone pulled a trigger on a filter land, and then yes. they didn't follow at that point because enough people had mana base established. Yep. If, especially if you're in three color, I think the filter lands are probably better than f- duels in this than, than traditional duels in a lot of decks in this format. You yeah. know, because like especially if you don't have the fetches. So like in my in VRD two in my three colors, I didn't have the, a lot of the, I didn't have the fetches. I had I didn't have the duels. Those filter lands just carried so much weight. You know, it's so like you're trying to cast a fairy time reveler. You're you know because they give you so much fun. I can go for blue blue white 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 blue whatever. Mm-hmm. I just think those are massively, massively undervalued and underdrafted. I mean, not even undervalued, just underdrafted. I think that they are it's, better it's than... It's a signet advantage, right? It's the same reason in Ravnica, the signets were so great at letting you play multiple right. colors. But, like, that, the blue-black one was available of this. Yes. Yes. Right, and it's better because it taps for colorless, where this does not. It, it's better if you're in exactly those two colors. If you're in three colors, this can let you go red into blue-black. Right. So it there, there's but this also just doesn't tap for mana though when it's in your opening hand. Correct. Right, where that at least taps for. Yeah, no, no, mana, I, I yeah. think that they're they're both very good. Um, they're just different. Right. Um, which colors, if you were in an artifact deck in the blind, which colors do you want to be in? I think Hyphenated's right that you want to be in blue just because you have a lot of the main effects there. Yeah. But I think generally, if you're in an artifact deck, you play so few cards that are colored that you can often play three colors pretty easily. I was in blue, red, um, black in my artifact deck. Yeah, I think blue and black so are the Grixis. natural too. And the black was really just for Lily and uh, a couple other kind of functionary spells. But, I mean, realistically... You want to have some Eldrazi. Like, you right. just have so much play to it that I think it really just depends on what your table looks like. But blue, definitely. Yes. Um, but yeah, that is the that is the draft of VRD. That's a high overall track through of what all the players did in this draft. Uh, noticeable cards that missed, right? I think True Name we already mentioned. Right. That's one that somebody It didn't end up going at all or not? It didn't go at all. Okay. This is one that was definitely missed. Yeah, I'm surprised Elaine didn't end up grabbing it. Yep. Um were there other ones that jumped out to you that you knew? Uh, so Elaine actually dislikes True Name. I, I've, okay. We've talked about this before. She thinks that it is too slow for this format, that you will cast it, and then they will kill you the next turn. Okay. Um, I think she's wrong. I um, do too. But that's fine. I, I think that's um, a reasonable opinion to hold. At, at first I thought Cradle and CJ's deck, but looking now at CJ's deck, I don't think Cradle is necessarily... He had a lot of creatures in there. Yeah. I mean, it just, if he gets the Mana Dork start, it becomes another fast bit, but he, he was fast enough, so probably Cradle. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, at some point, there's something... There's a creature that he drafted that he didn't play mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, Cradle easily becomes a replacement for, right? Definitely agree with um, that. So in a field with this much green, which which cards are the anti-green cards that didn't get drafted? Acid Rain went. Acid Rain went. Um, oh, he's not like... Death Grip. Death Grip. Uh, Submerge was one that I don't think anyone drafted. Uh, but yeah, so Submerge, I think, would have definitely been really So I don't know if it was in the right... I, I Maybe John would have been right for, right for Death Grip here, but that would have been about it, I think. No one else had enough black to... But there were like four or five green players at the table. Like, right. There, there should have been a lot more green hate. I flowing. mean, so there's obviously a lot of good... Like, I can think of all the good island hate, right? You know, like Choke and Boil. Yep. And so what are the other... Uh, th- there's a bunch. We have an episode right. up on YouTube about it to look through all the good hate cards. And then you don't need... Uh, I mean, anti- no one cares about anti-planes hate, so you don't need any conversion. To... <laughs> or conversion conver- conversion makes mountains into planes, but no one, there's not enough mountains played either. So. No. I mean, if, if, you're, if you are worried about white, this Gloom is the card is, you want. Yeah, Gloom. Gloom is ridiculous. Right. It's just the mo- most rude card ever. <laughs> um, yeah, the Academy gives you a second land to draw. That's That's fair. It's a good call. Common. Um, I, I think that green has really moved up over this last year. It's kind of yeah. in, this, in like a 2019 review. I think green has moved up with cards like Collector Oof really giving it a lot more play than it used to have. Yeah, Collector Oof, cool. solid. 
Um, did did all of the Titans go? So Emrakul went. Did Kozilek? No, Koz. Did Kozilek not. did not move. Right. So I mean, if you see something the original, like Brandon, yeah, so Ulamog, and then I think just those two. Uh, I know Ulamog went, and original Ulamog not. Correct. Yeah, both Ulamogs Oh, both went. Ulamogs went. Okay, he had both. Wow. Yeah, exactly. that's what I'm saying. CJ had right. a lot of big things. Right. Um, but Kozilek did not go. So I think okay. in, a, in a world where Brandon is running the amount of uh, mill that he is running, I would like to see someone with yeah. Kozilek in their deck. Someone took Guy's Blessing for the for Oh, the did mill. they? That's, uh, that's kind of cool. Viviano did. Nice. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah, Viviano took Blessing. That's a good one. Um, oh, Expedition Map is a really good call. Uh, exp- did Expedition Map go? No. So that's one that I would think that Mike Viviano would have wanted yeah. in his deck. Yeah, I think Expedition Map's great for certain decks. I mean, you just need, you know, but you have to have lands you definitely, definitely want. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about Hindering Light. This is a card that <laughs> uh, Common is saying we should have talked about in the Countersville episode. Uh, this card is real bad. It's just oh, really bad. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, it's it was never great. It was never... I don't know about really bad. It has. It can only target a permanent you control, so it's not the you target or a permanent. You right. Control. So it can't win counter wars. Right. It stops burn spells, I guess. Right. Hand yeah, no, it's bad. It costs two you're right. mana. You're right. <laughs> it doesn't stop the one after the one they cast. You're right. You're right. You're There's right. just like a whole bunch but, of reasons this card's bad. Yeah. Uh, there, there were probably some worse ones on the list. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Mystic Snake and Furled Mystic were really cool. I'm glad yeah, to see both and again, of that was the heavy end of the theory. I mean, because again, if you're going to go Flash there. I mean, and yep. I said that he was like, Cody was like, well, are those too slow? I'm like, no, they're not too slow. I mean, the, occasionally, yeah, you're just losing on turn three. But the, the, you, this is a format where you either lose on turn three or it becomes a grindy fest. Like, Absolutely. And, you know, they... And Mystic Snake is, and then therefore Furled Mystic by default, but I'm OG enough that Mystic Snake is in my top five cards of all time. So, <laughs> you know, if there's anything that... Uh, Simic Charm was one that I really liked that... Uh, yeah. Simic Charm's great. Let's get that one on the screen. Um, so Simic Charm, it just like has so much versatility. Yeah, it's just pump for an extra win, permanence gain hexproof, or you know a bounce. I think generally we see this card in the Infect deck, which we haven't seen in the last few. Right. Um, but since two. Yeah, since two we haven't seen it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, and it's a bounce. Uh, it's just creature. Okay. Um, because I was thinking, it's like, is that bounce any permanent? Because I was thinking about like uh, that time when Modern first hit, and I was boomeranging your uh, your lands back to your so hand. So rude. <laughs> Plow under boomerangs. Yeah, I think if, if boomerang were actually a, bo- a bo- if Simic Charm were a boomerang, it would be probably cost three mana. You're right. Um, but no, it's cool. Brazen Borrower was absolutely phenomenal for for Cody. There, it's another great pack. I, I like Brazen Borrower a lot, and I like it not because it's, I think it's the best card, best version of this effect. It's just so versatile i mean that's it, it is versatile but it's yeah. also worse than other cards right so like i really it like, can't it can't save your own permanence correct that's right. that's the thing i love about this right. it's like it can't save your own permanence it doesn't get the cool uh triggering effect of echoing truth it right. doesn't get the it can't, chain of vapor effect it can't block creatures in the ground right it like it, it has it's a worse version of every other card but it has two cards stapled together and it's just right. like really cool in that way um, Fabled so, Passage was a bad pick. Uh, yeah, that pick was garbage. Though I will say that Elaine has really staked out um, the Prismatic Vista as the best fetch in the format, and uh, she's right on that call. I think she. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, again, it's a format where you're going to have mostly basics. It's going to get you what you want, what you need. Yep. And she grabbed a what fourth pick? Did she really that early? Fifth pick. Wow, that is impressive. It's the best fetch in the format. I mean, lands a land generally goes in that round. That's fair. A fetch generally goes, right? Why wouldn't you get a fetch that's going to get you everything? She also got the Cataxian Probe in 10th pick, which I think is about right for it as well. Like, that card is very good. I think last time it floated to around 15. Um, but th- that's a card that should just... Yeah, I don't think... Uh, so I drafted Urza and didn't end up even main decking it in two... Or yeah. I main decked it, ended up, I main decked it, but I ended up sighted out almost every game, um, and I don't know if it ever did anything for Elaine here. So I'm not convinced that Urza is a rock star in this format yet. I could be, pre- I'm ready to be proven wrong on that. You don't have the same density of artifacts in this format that you do in Vintage, so I, I'm not sure. We'll see. Yeah, has Sterns been drafted before? That's a good question. Ancient Sterns? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's do pick. Ancient Stirring. Uh, Ancient Historians spent three times of the 34, so probably not in this format, no. Right. Not not, not in our group, at least. Um, but, no, it, it certainly is pickable, right. especially in somebody like Cody's deck. Yeah, yeah, it would have been good there. But, yeah, it's 
I don't know. I think I think that Urza in combination with something like uh, Winter Orb right. could end up being very good, uh, which is another card that I don't think we've seen drafted very often, but no. probably should. Well, that's did not what um, I want to say Brandon picked Winter Orb in three. Yeah, that card's very good. Um, I, I would like to see an actual Storm deck take off. I've been th- I, I've had I brought one along and played it. I played it in three games and it won three out of three. Um, so obviously that's right. in, in the dark. It's it's a realistic version of the deck that could be built, but it, it wasn't drafted against. So that being said, right, there's no sideboard cards against it, things like that. But it, it, it performed very well. It was a doomsday right. storm we, deck. We still have the looming burn question. Um, yep. Still you haven't know. seen burn in this one. And I still think that I, I said it during the... Um... Urza Thopter went last time in PDX. That's nice. pretty cool. Uh, I still, well, that's what I was going for, for mine. I just never pulled it off. Yeah. Um, I still think that a blue-red kind of counterburn, with, cause I think that um, the Royal Scions makes that pretty decent. Like, the Royal Scions yeah. and um, the G- Stomp slash the Giant uh, Bone Crusher, yep. I think that make, makes that very possible. Yeah, we didn't see a Splinter Twin this time around, um, which is pretty usual to see. Um, but no, I think it was this was overall... Uh, really cool. There were a lot of new players that got in there that have never played before, yeah. so it's good to see fresh blood running through. Um, do you want to move on to the next one? Yeah, Talk let's move on. The let's next one. On. So for the next VRD, it's going to be running on February 2nd. Uh, uh, you said first to me earlier. Which Feb- one is Sorry, it? February 1st. It's a Saturday. It's a Saturday this time. The first yeah. Saturday I was VRD. like, I had looked into my calendar to make sure I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be running on February yes. 1st. Uh, we already have our eight players locked in, so... Without further ado, let's cut over to those players. We're going to have these folks up here right now. So Brandon Curry, obviously the illustrious second place finisher. Right. uh, Who's managed to make it in uh, into this last two, going from three to two. And he's claimed that he's going to take first pick. Uh, he's going to take first again for this next one. That's uh, a pretty guy. I don't know. He's, he's pretty. I, I don't know. If we had to say most uh, handsome drafter at the table. I, I think he's he's clearly in the running. He's at the least running, second right. pick. I'm I'm not on the table, so that yeah that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, then uh, hold on, the chat's not showing up quite correctly. I don't know what's going on with it. Eh, whatever. Um, but we we also have just to his right is Kyle Vance. I don't yeah. even know Kyle pretty so well. Kyle, I don't know super well. Kyle is a local grinder, though. Um, kind of a local all-star grinder. Very very solid player with a good base of knowledge across multiple formats. So yep. I expect Kyle to be competitive. Um, he, he plays at Moonbase pretty regularly yeah. and always does very well in those tournaments. I've judged many, many, and many a PPTQ with, uh, yes. <laughs> with Kyle. In the he, top eight, probably. The, and uh, then the... the as the story of the last one was Elaine crushing everybody, the right. story of this one is to bring back all the people we think can beat Elaine. So right. in our third person, here is Dan Zielinski, who obviously won VRD2. With Infect. Correct. With, with my... So the, we had the trio. It was a three-way tie at the top. Yep. Um, I, we each had two losses, but the thing was I beat Elaine, Dan beat... Or I beat Elaine, Elaine beat Dan, Dan beat me. Right, and, and that created the, the tiebreak system right. that we have now instead, right. where we actually force those things to but play D- out. But Dan clearly won off of the old tiebreak system, and then Elaine and I had to negotiate. Yes. Uh, so Dan, Dan, hopefully, we'll see if he runs back the Infect thing. Right. He has a lot of play to him, um, but he's obviously a really strong player. Then the Titan, Elaine, is coming back yep. to see if she can hold on and take three victories in a row. Uh, it'd be pretty impressive. This time she doesn't have the silver bullet up uh, in her gun, but we'll see what she's going to try to pull back with. Or at least the silver known. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> True. Uh, that's, that's a good question, actually. Where do you think Arcane Savant falls? It's got to be first three rounds. Easy. Yeah, top five. You think top five? Top five picks or top, top five, five picks? Oh, okay. No, no, top five rounds. I think I think first five rounds. I think it's in the first two rounds. Okay. But we'll see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she can't win because Brandon's taking first, <laughs> there he we says. Go. Yeah. Uh, sorry, B. Curry says. Who knows who that could be? But um, next next to Elaine, Naveen is actually going to be flying in for this one. Naveen so won VRD1. He won VRD1. Uh, Finished moved mid-range. away. Right. Yeah, he moved Finished away. Finished mid in VRD2. Correct. Um, but he, he he finished mid in VRD2. I think he finished fourth place, which earned him a buy under the old structure to right. come back in. But he wasn't able to he move. He wasn't able to come in, so now he's flying in to, to redeem his buy right. to see if he can get in for the next one after this. Um, 
So Naveen, obviously, is known for his five-color nonsense and for playing lots of casual decks, but really can turn on the the power level when he needs super to. Super smart guy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sitting next to him here is John Ryan Hamilton. John Ryan is is a all-star Death and Taxes player. He's uh, finished regularly in major tournaments and top eights. Uh, he won something major recently, and I don't know what it was, but he, he's kind of a Death and Taxes, um, been playing it in Legacy for a decade, and uh, one of Elaine's least favorite people to play against, which is why he got the invite this time. So, <laughs> Bring it in the head. Huh? Exactly. We're trying, we're trying to do everything we can. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if he if he sticks to his known quantity right. or whether he plays outside that box a little bit. But I know he's really excited for this. No, I mean, on that, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think straight up death and taxes is right, but I think a dead, I think dead guy ale is yes. amazing in, in VRD. I think dead guy ale has got lots of lots of legs. Well, in VRD one. Uh, Elaine drafted a blue-white deck that was mostly Death and Taxes. Right. Um, whereas I drafted a black-white deck that was mostly Dead Guy Ale, right. or a Pikula-type deck. So, um, then uh, then sitting next to there is Robert Shelley. Um, I don't know Robert Shelley. Neither of well. us know Robert. Uh, Robert came on the recommendation of our other steering committee members, Eric and... Thurston. Yep, I know he's an old school player. He's been playing around for a decade, uh, mostly in eternal formats. So he definitely has deep format knowledge. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what he's doing. Um, obviously, he's first time in a VRD, so that's going to be interesting. Um, we have here we have four players who have never played in a VRD with Robert Shelley, John Ryan Hamilton, and Kyle Vance, all never having played, and also Matt Wynn, who was on commentary last time, coming in to see what it's like driving driving from the seat. That'll be an interesting one. So Matt, uh, you know, Matt had some I Matt listened to Matt on commentary was interesting because you think you you could tell he had an idea of what the format was going to be like yep. and it didn't turn up to be like that. <laughs> so sometimes he had question about cards yes. and we just like nope nope those aren't the cards that you're looking for. Uh, you know we uh-huh. we we'd, we'd droid wipe them nope. And so but having been on the commentary and seen it now he's definitely going to have uh, a different take and and he's a bright and fun guy so it should be uh, it should be a great experience. So. Yes, he definitely will do a lot of research and get into it. But yeah. um, as is kind of the goal, we're going to have four people that have played before and four people that are coming in with the two previous top two finishers yeah. coming in as well. And so. hopefully, uh, one thing we've ran into in the past somewhat is we've ended up having to go to our reserve list a lot, but we've implemented some mechanisms to try to reduce that. And I I'm feeling good that we will have uh, the majority of these here. Absolutely. And Common, you're totally right. I believe in this case, um, our grindstone player actually took both of those. They took them in 15th and, or 13th and 14th yes. pick. Yes. So yeah, that's a pretty regular strategy. Um, so, uh, but yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see what happens in uh, in this next one. So February 1, save it at the date. Um, probably going to be starting early in the morning again. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have myself... Uh, Eric Levine and uh, Jason Thurston on mixing it on commentary. So we're going to be switching up a little bit of our commentary style, moving in a three-person crew. Um, we'll have players in for interviews. Some players in as interviews by voting as normal, but we'll have less players in for commentary, trying to improve the consistency overall of, of the commentary, making sure we're maximizing engagement. And I'll be back spinning the ones and twos, um, getting everything running we're actually going to have deck lists up as well this time. So yeah, come over here. So yeah, but next to that, this time we're going to have deck lists on screen. So if you've used Cardboard Live or seen SCG or anybody, any of the main kind of tournaments, you always have the deck lists on the side there. We'll be able to see what people are running in their main deck as well as yep. what cards are in their sideboard. Um, and we'll have standings that you can check through there so you don't have to keep switching over and asking, and we don't have to keep telling you what the standings are. You we'll have the return of some giveaways. Yep, exactly. But so this time we'll have a better plan for the giveaways so we're not making <laughs> things up on the spot. So it won't be, what card am I thinking of? <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty sweet. We were able to give away a Judge Foil Ristic Study, Judge Foil Monastery Mentor, yeah. uh, a Foil German Gitrog Monster? Not Foil, no. just a Russian Gitrog okay. Monster. And then the full art Yarvo, yeah, um, which is pretty cool to give away. Um, but yeah, so we'll see what what's going to happen the next time. But tune in. Um, ho- hope you get to see what's going on and try to run your own VRD. Yeah. Um, uh, we will probably, due to the time, I was hoping to be able to do at the end of the month a Theros show. Ooh. But due to the VRD being in the first week, I, weekend, I doubt we'll be able to pull it off. Do so, we know when Theros gets released? Theros release, pre-release weekend. Well, actually, we might be able to pull that off because Theros pre-release weekend, we'll have the list by pre-release weekend, and the pre-release weekend is the 18th and 19th. 18th and 19th of 
Feb- January. January, okay. So it'll definitely be out. So um, like, but we could that Declos will be out. We could do a stream that midweek. So yeah. we might. Uh, Mark and I will get together and try to see if we'll do a Thero show, like we did with. Um, uh, throne, yep. where we could talk about like what cards in, in Theros might make an appearance. So if we can get that scheduled down, not promising it, but uh, I think we might be able to make that work. So be very cool. Are there any secondary sets that are going to be spoiled by that time, but not out yet? No. Okay. No. That's, we're not going to end up with the, the no, ugly the, half printed. No, really. the weird one will be <laughs> uh, the VRD the number two this year because it'll be all those commander okay. set because there's like right around Kiora or whatever the Behemoth That's right. stuff. They're going to be the first set of the 92 Commander releases this year. Yep. Um, so that will be that June-ish, May-June one will end up be having like a lot of extra stuff. a lot of. And that's going to be at the end of May. We don't have an official announcement for that one yet, but it's going to be a special event that's uh, even special by VRD standards. Ooh. So we'll be getting more information about that one right. when, when it's when the other stuff around it is finished. So. Yep. We've been, uh, we've been meeting in the background a lot and doing a lot of planning and trying to uh, look for a lot more announcements and things to come. We're, we're trying to make this a, um, <laughs> that would be funny. A non blue draft. I don't know. <laughs> Mark, Mark's heart. Is oh, I just, <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you, you can't do that to this guy. That, that sounds uh, terrible. Yeah. So we're just, uh, we're constantly looking and taking recommendations because we're kind of always thinking about how to make this a better product and better for you, better for us. Uh, odds are pretty good. There's going to be some non VRD content showing up here eventually as well over the year. Um, not that we're still going to do the quarterly VRD events, but uh, there's some vintage cubes that are getting built around St. Louis. Uh, so it'd be pretty fun to stream some of those as well. And it'd be good to have those. Um, good gamer did one. Nice. Yep. Yeah. If you, if you look at the archives, um, if that, um, exclamation point draft will give you a link to it but those archives actually have a list of all of the vrds that we know about hyphen has done a ton of work for it and uh compiled a lot of those so oh, rochester draft you can dig through all those yeah rochester drafting is great uh, but yeah that, that would actually be that would be fun just throw a camera over top of a table and just have <laughs> the entire thing spread out there that we better to do this yeah so well, they did Rochester at uh, Gen Con this year. Oh, did they? It was the final for that. That was this, the special event this year. It was the final of they got to Rochester the the vintage cu- or the Legacy Cube. Cool. They a, a real copy of the Legacy Cube that they yeah. pulled together and they Rochestered it. I mean, yeah, Rochester is great. They did it at every Pro Tour for a long time. Yeah, but. All right. Uh, anything else you got? No, that's all I got. Cool. All right. Well, thanks all for tuning in. We'll Thank see you, you much. at the beginning of.